All right. So um, I will hand it over to uh, Ben and Jason to uh, kick us off. Great. Um, I guess I'll I'll go. Uh, thanks everybody for joining today. It's it's great um, to be talking to so many staff and faculty members. Um, we've been working on this, as many people know, for a long time. Um, this is a deck that's going to go over uh, the the campaign. It's been kind of branded breaking new ground. It's all about the new middle school and high school building. Uh, the efforts on this have been you know six years in the making, and they're um, kind of coming um, to uh, the bond vote in March. So we'll talk about the project and kind of how we intend to to get there from here. So why don't we start with introductions? Uh, no, no, we skip over. Oh, what are we doing? <laughs> I can go fast. I don't know if I can go that fast. <laughs> Great, awesome. Um, let's go ahead and do introductions. I'm uh, Ben Ford. I'm a, sc a school board rep from Woodstock. I've got two kids at Wes, uh, first and third grader. I chair the finance committee and the new build committee. And um, that's how I've, I've gotten involved with this. Jason, do you wanna go? Sure, I'm Jason Jabitko. I have three kids, two kids now in the district. Three have gone through the district. I've been involved with the project since 2016, the very beginning on various uh, committees here and there. Now I'm primarily involved in fundraising for the project. Marlena? I'm Karen, I'm Karen Briscoe and I'm the chair of the school board, but nobody needs to convince me why we need a school, a new school since I taught there for 39 years. I have three alumni myself. I'm Marlena McNamee. I'm the um, district uh, fundraising manager and I have three kids in the district. and. Sherry is there too. I guess she should introduce. Sorry, I skipped over you, Sherry. Oh no, well, Sherry's with a different thing. I think most people know me. That's good. Yep. And here's what we'll cover today: um, just how we got to where we are, um, the history of it, and um, you know, the need. And a lot of the, the the purpose here is really so. You know, I'm sure that a lot of people on this call have been you know getting questions, whether it's students or community members or um, you know others who are just interested about the project this is really to equip you with the information that you need um, to address that as a member of the school community but then also to help kind of make up your own mind and decide what actions you want to take um, you know with regard to the project so yeah we can go to the next so yeah this is uh, sorry Marlena do you want I don't have the who's who as far as um, whose slides are or who's in front of me is this sorry who? oh yeah this would be um, you Ben okay great thank you yeah, so this is um, we've known for a long time. Anybody who works in the in the middle school uh, or high school building or um, who's been inside of it, you know, knows that the um, the high school was built in uh, fifty eight. The middle school was an addition ten years later. It, it wasn't really made of uh, materials that were built to last a long time. It had a, an intended uh, useful life of about forty years. That's what you see for the kinds of materials that were used in in that building. And um, as we all know, we're starting to experience, um, you know, issues with kind of the end of life of, of the, the, the building as it's kind of, you know, breaking down. Um, just this last uh, two years ago, I should say, uh, we lost six classrooms due to the failing heating system. Um, had to put in March an emergency uh, bond measure on the on the ballot. Um, thankfully, it passed for 1.2 million in heating upgrades. That's very visible. You can see the the you know, heating work, duct work going through the hallways of the of the high school, um, you know, currently as they wrap that that project up. But that's just the, the kind of tip of the ugly iceberg. The state did an assessment last year and gave us a report that uh, inventories twenty five million dollars worth of repairs that are needed fairly urgent, urgently with that building. So it really kind of raises the question. Do we want to you know put that kind of money into this you know failing uh, facility or you know pour it towards a new building where we can um, you know hopefully do more good for our students, school community, um, and uh, everybody involved. Um, lots of things are at risk of a, of com a complete system failure. And uh, one message that's important um, as you're talking with parents and community members is that the building is safe. It's not like we've got an, you know a PCB or asbestos exposures that are have been identified above level, something that would cause us to have to get you know um, 
students out of the building, but it doesn't meet code, right? So you can say that it's not an imminent threat of, of you know, hurting somebody, but at the same time, it doesn't meet um, ADA. There's no fire suppression system throughout the building. Structural and security, um, you know, codes have come a long way since the building was, was implemented. Okay, and then, um, sorry, is this, does this go to Jason? Sorry. This is, is, um, no, no, that's okay. This is um, Carrie. Okay, great. Thank you. For the next few slides. Okay, yes, sure. Um, we all know that education has changed quite a bit in the, in the, over the years and the uh, building uh, room configurations, the various things that um, help learning are not present currently in the building with the the air quality systems um, and some of the space needs that would be better suited for today's student. So as we seek to build a new school where all of those things have been taken into consideration, you as faculty have had much input in changing uh, the design of the building and configuring it in a way that makes sense for the students that you teach, as well as putting groups of like uh, teachers together and having extra space for breakout groups and all of those kinds of things that we enjoy doing and teaching today, but are hard in a school the way it is set up in our, in, in, in the current high school, middle school. Next, Carrie, are you ready for the next slide? Yeah, okay. Did you change it? Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, yes. So. You know, when when the room is Sorry. cold, if the room is too hot, all those things affect the way um, you're going to be uh, educated. And so with the air quality problems, um, the lighting, all of those things are affecting um, the ability of students to fully access their education. And so for that reason, uh, among others, it's time for a new building and it's time to have up-to-date facilities with um, cutting edge spaces for learning and teaching. Here are some quotes that um, different people have contributed. I'll just let you take a look at that for a couple of minutes. I think they speak for themselves. I don't think I need to make any comment on that. Great. I think Jason is going to take over here. here. Thank you. Good. Um, I'm up. Thanks. Well, first of all, uh, I think as Ben said, we've been at this for a long time, since 2016. And thank you to all of you who have participated, um, pro provided input in the project um, to date. I know this past year in particular, you all have been working hard on the program with Lee Sherwood and LaValle Bretzinger, the master plan team. And I'm sort of filling in for him on this section. So to speak. Um, so I just wanted to take you through a little bit of the timeline because we've been doing a lot of work over the last um, uh, six, seven years here. And over the course of the presentation, we hope to hit the highlights or the key questions that we've heard most frequently. Uh, and one of those is, this has been going on a long time and we've been doing a lot of planning, a lot of very detailed planning starting in 2016 when the Buildings and Grounds Committee authorized a group of board staff and community members to evaluate the facility. And so as a result, we went out and raised $150,000 in private funding um, to hire a team, a master planning team. Uh, in this case, it happened to be LaValle Brensinger, who has been working with us all along. And one of the things we like to say about LaValle Brensinger in that process in 2017 was that um, we issued an RFP. There were a lot of firms that um, sent in proposals and a lot of um, architect, fancy architects and all, all sorts of te teams and architects from all over New England. And we chose LaValle Brensinger because we thought they'd be the best fit with our community. They had values that were aligned with ours. They seemed very practical uh, and sensible. And, and we were not looking for an architecture team that was wanted to win awards, so to speak. So we chose LaValle Brensinger and they've been with us ever since. Um, they were they set out in 2018 to evaluate the facility condition. So look at the overall condition of the facility in every every aspect. At that time, uh, board members, community members, staff, and faculty were also brought together to start some visioning sessions. And some of you were fortunate enough to go around the country and look at best um, best practices in education facility design. 
2019, we raised another $200,000 in private funding, grant money, um, to ask Lavalley Brensinger to look at various options, which we'll go over in the next slide, um, for what, how to address some of those issues. Uh, at the same time, the configuration committee of the board was tasked with evaluating financial feasibility of the new building. Uh, ben will speak a little bit to that later, but as a result of that, um, it, the, the project was deemed not feasible without a public-private partnership uh, through bond funding alone, and we'll talk more about that later. 2021, uh, the, the Valley Brensinger completed a total uh, facility design for a new build, because at that time in 2019, it was determined by the board that a new build was the most cost-effective uh, way forward. Uh, a, a new build schematic design was completed in, in 2021, and there's a note there too about an enrollment study. In the New England, what's NESDC, remind me? New England School Development. Ben, do you, got, do you know? I can get off mute. Yeah, it's the New England School Development Commission. Yeah. Out of Massachusetts, or remember. Uh, completed an enrollment study uh, for our district that projected uh, 120 plus new students uh, by, by 20, 2023. And so we were one of the few districts in the state projected to have a, an increase in enrollment over time that will come into play later. 2022 uh, was the first time that pu public money was really involved in this project. It, the Woodstock EDC uh, funded Marlena, in a sense, to be the part-time fundraising manager. And then 2023 was the first time this project was really taken to the public in the form of a, um, a vote. Uh, and that's when we were able to secure 1.65 million for further detailed design and permitting leading up to where we are today. Twenty three, which Ben will speak to later, and very importantly, is the board implemented a new tax impacts policy. So this slide, okay, so this is 2019 um, when we looked at options analysis, three different scenarios. Um, and this is important, important because the question still comes up, why can't we renovate? So we looked at three options, um, renovation only on the left, option one, renovation in addition and a new build. And we, the team looked at it two ways, both from a qualitative perspective in terms of educational outcomes, and that's where you see these total scores. There's a lot of detail behind that. And then of course, cost. And remember, this is, these are 2019 dollars. So in option one, um, the team really tried to look at, could you renovate this building? Um, and to do so, you'll see the middle school in this option is replaced because the middle school cannot be renovated due to it, the type of construction it is. It's kind of concrete slab construction and you cannot penetrate the, you know, as you'll hear, uh, if you go on the tour, you cannot penetrate the walls of the middle school um, or actually compromise the integrity of the structure. So that comes off the table as being an option to be able to renovate. Option one builds a new uh, facility where the middle school is and then adds on everything in yellow is new um, to hit the educational outcomes that, um, that came out of the vis visioning process. Option one um, adds a lot of space. So it it's, becomes an expensive project to achieve those educational outcomes. And remember, we have cinder block walls that can't be moved. Uh, in that option, you still have a very poor building envelope. So you're adding uh, new spaces onto the old building, but never really curing the issue with the old building. You'll still have heat loss and all sorts of things. So uh, the team looked at this and said, you know, it, it's 78 million in 2019. It's more expensive than building new. The other issue there uh, with renovation is that this is staged over five years when the students are in the building. So you have temporary conditions, which cost a lot of money. You have to put students in trailers, move them around the building during the construction process. It becomes very disruptive and uh, costly. So option two, new build ended up coming in uh, at a lower cost uh, because basically you're able to build a new facility on the football field, keep students in school, uh, becomes much more efficient. You end up with optimal outcomes uh, high energy efficiency, you're able to go for a net zero project, um, and you're able to have the spaces you ultimately wanted in the in the visioning process, the spaces that are appropriate to you know, modern day learning and teaching. Next slide. 
Okay, so just some quick summary. There's really not a do nothing scenario. Uh, we hear that a lot in our conversations with the community. Um, and as you heard from Ben, the State of Vermont Agency of Education and um, in the Buildings and Grounds Committee have detailed 20 plus million dollars in sort of immediate fixes. So there's not a do nothing scenario and there's probably not even a $20 million scenario, which I keep hearing from people that they want. Um, there's probably not even a $30 million scenario. Uh, schools as a building type are expensive to build. So the other thing we hear is like, man, this is a, this is so expensive, $80 million. It, uh, school buildings in general are in a very expensive building type, particularly high schools uh, because of the labs and types of spaces involved. So schools are just expensive to build or renovate. Uh, we learned from the options analysis that our current facility is beyond the point of renovation. In that building a new school is the highest value, most cost-effective way forward with better educational outcomes and lower operating and long-term costs. So lower operating costs because the current building is completely energy inefficient. Um, and a new building, we're looking at a net zero building with geothermal um, and zero energy costs over time. Uh, and long-term costs because a new building uh, requires less fixes in the short term. The other, the other uh, point here is that a new school retains existing families and attracts new ones, critical to the successful business model for our district in decreasing taxes in the long run. We'll get to that as well, but the, that point speaks to how important enrollment is attracting new students and retaining students to our long-term financial success as a district. Excellent. So out of all the workshops that some of you all had participated in, board members and community members and the board um, voting to endorse uh, a new school, pursuing a new school, this was the project purpose and vision statement that came out of all of that, which was to create a safe and inspiring new middle and high school for our community to be proud of and our students to thrive in, a school that ensures that our children can compete in a new world, one driven by innovation, technology, and sustainability, and to honor the fundamental values of our beloved Vermont education, community, and environmental stewardship. And lastly, to ensure the future of our children and our community, because uh, good schools are fundamental to the success of a, a community. Okay, uh, I'll go over these quickly, because I think most of you have been involved in this last round in providing feedback on the new school design. Um, this is a, uh, a site plan for the new school, uh, you'll note Union Arena on the top left. Uh, the new school building is oriented pretty close to Union Arena and oriented to the river. It is directly on the football field. And it's hard to see, but there is the outline, a dotted, very subtle dotted outline of the existing school on what is the football field there. So again, the benefit, one of the benefits of new is that you're able to keep students in school while the new school is being built and then move them over um, just like that. So one of the things back when, one of the one of the points we hear again is, hey, this looks like it's a very fancy school. Is it gold plated? And the response um, is no. Uh, the design for this new school is very efficient, flexible, and practical. And Lee Sherwood likes to say like a Subaru. Um, and as I noted, the team that we had selected very early on was very value driven. And that was one of the qualities that we were looking for when the committee in 2016, 2017 selected, selected the firm. Okay, next one. Uh, so Lavalle Bensinger are experts in educational space planning. And they've executed many different projects that are quite similar to what we're shooting for with our school. These are some examples of similar uh, facilities that are, I'd say, value driven. They're not fancy facilities. They're practical and efficient, but you can see that uh, modern school facilities have really nice spaces and they're able to do so at sort of an average cost. These are some of the facilities similar to what the feel might be like in, in this, our new school in terms of the theater and the central gathering space, atrium, cafeteria space as well. But you'll see not, lots of natural light, natural materials. Um, used collaborative spaces, kind of flexible spaces as well. Next slide. Uh, this is looking at the front facade of the building. Union Arena is on your right. 
Um, and again, the design is is meant to reference Vermont vernacular style, sort of uh, almost like a collection of barns. Um, the materials selected are very durable, practical, and efficient, but designed to last 40, 50, 60 years in some case cases. But what we realized from kind of looking at how this is sited is that this is a really incredible site. It faces the mountains in three directions. It's south facing, so great for solar. Um, it faces the river and the school should embrace all those things and you should feel good when you're inside the building. Next slide. Okay, so this is facing the river, just showing this, the solar uh, orientation. Uh, also footnote that I think the current group is looking at full geothermal um, and there's a funder for that which is great. Uh, this building is on the exact same footprint as the old building from an area-wise, uh, area, square footage of area footprint-wise. It's just it's two stories. Uh, so it's slightly larger just because of the nature of the spaces today and, and collaborative spaces required. Um, also, there are outdoor classrooms uh, and gardens and teaching spaces that have been incorporated with your feedback. Next slide. Uh, this is sort of the 3D render, which I think you've all seen, um, arranged uh, class classes and um, content areas arranged as a collection of teams. A middle school, Ryan Becker will be happy because he's been advocating for this for a long time. It's, it's quite separate, um, separate experience from the high school, but all organized around the central commons. And that commons is really purposefully intended to be a multi-use space. Um, functions as a cafeteria sometimes, it functions as a meeting space, it functions as a performance space, a gathering space. And the way this is designed is that different sections of the building can be shut off um, after hours. So you could have performance in the theater, but have the have, a, have an athletic event, have the commons open. It's also designed um, very specifically for today in modern security where sections can be locked down, the vestibule can be locked down, the wings can be locked down um, to the, the highest um, best practices in terms of modern day security as well. A double gym, so there's a space that can fit the whole student body for the first time as well. Uh, next slide. So I think this has been starting to talk about cost. Oh, yeah. Oh, my mic is on. Great. All right. Um, and this is kind of picking up on uh, the point Jason was making about the architect being very value driven. Uh, one of the criticisms, as he said, you know, that we get is, boy, this thing is really is um, must be pretty opulent. And it's just not the case. Uh, you can see some comparisons there. Massachusetts currently has about five um, approved building uh, school buildings. And uh, they've got a, a whole different funding model, a lot more, you know, kind of taxpayer support. And those come in around $730 a square foot in Massachusetts. In northern New England, Maine, New Hampshire, you know, what you see is around $520 per square foot for recent school buildings. And that's right where our project is expected to come in at, you know, $80 million. Um, it's kind of what we're it's, um it's expecting right you come out to about 518 a square foot so it's it's uh, right you know right in the middle and one other point is um you know for those who have you know, for a long time we've had uh you know headwinds on the project like there's some things that are you know kind of tricky about vermont's funding formula well, can't we just wait to see what happens well every year we wait we see escalations of three to five percent you saw that that um pricing from you know, 2019 when it was you know, 68, 67, 68 million, 21, it was up to 73.4 you know, million. And now we're looking at potentially, you know, 80, 85 million that these things don't get better with age. They just get more expensive with inflation. So in terms of paying for the school, there's kind of three, three areas that, that we've looked at um, on the um, rundown of the history, you know, we got to a point as a school board where we realized that the project was not financially feasible and that additional support would be needed. One thing that every other New England state has that Vermont does not is a school construction aid program. By law, Vermont is required to fund 30% of approved uh, school building projects. 
Uh, the trouble is that that program was suspended in 2007, kind of in the run up to the Great Recession, and the state is, has never brought it back. There's a report that's due in January uh, where we expect the uh, House Education Committee to announce you know, what the plans are for bringing that program back. They've had a number of other states kind of in testifying um, in front of the committee, but we'll have to see. If that were to come through and we're not, you know, we're not waiting for it, it would be a game changer. And I'll show you the financials, kind of how that would, would play in. But at the current time, that's not really part of the equation, right? The state support piece. What is um, in scope is uh, a construction bond. Uh, schools are paid for by uh, approved bond referendums. And th that's a bond that would be approved by a majority of the voters across the seven um, towns, the voters in the seven towns of our, that make up our school district. It's just a simple majority is what we would take. Um, and it's no one town um, can really, you know, vote down the school bond, right? So it's not like if say Bridgewater and Plymouth um, the majority of the voters in those towns vote no, as long as there is enough voters in the other towns to make up for that, the bond would pass, just a simple majority. And then the private fundraising aspect is something just kind of looking around the state and, um, you know, seeing what kinds of schools have flourished over the last, say, 25 years. It's really the independent, the town academies who, who engage in a lot of private fundraising. There's nothing that prohibits us as a public school district from doing that. And that was uh, really the impetus for bringing on Marlena and organizing a, a capital campaign to support the building and setting a $20 million goal with a long horizon, right? That's over 10 years that we want to do that. Five years is the year, or sorry, 5 million is the year one goal. And we'll show you how that plays in. So um, I made some of these points on the, on the last slide, but uh, town meeting day is March 5th. And so that's going to, um, you know, so long as the costing comes through here in December and it's not something... Uh, completely outrageous. Um, the school board is expected to vote that with the uh, school budget as one kind of bond measure. And another one will be to um, approve the funding for the school building. Um, that assessment, um, like I said, it, it's the, the seven member towns in the school district are the uh, who will who will be impact, impacted. And it's really only the homestead taxpayers. That's kind of your primary residences throughout the school district. Business property and second homeowners are not impacted. They all uh, have their tax rates set at statewide rates that for many, many years have been higher than the homestead tax rates. What we're seeing now is that some of those homestead rates are creeping up um, uh, to be even with or higher even than some of the, the non-homestead property. But the key takeaway there is that if someone's got a business and they're concerned about taxes going up on their business property, that's not a thing. The school bond, the approved school bond doesn't impact businesses. Homestead, uh, and then there's another aspect of, of um, Vermont education finance, which is income sensitivity. Two thirds of taxpayers, uh, those homestead taxpayers, get some um, share of credit and that's up to $5,600 a year on the education side to help reduce their um, tax liability. And that um, just kicks in at about 138,000, anything ho household income less than that will qualify a, a taxpayer to you know, get a credit based on their income. Um, then, so it, that leaves the other kind of third of tax homestead taxpayers in our school district, um, if that you know is an accurate trend, that if you have a home around 400k, people will ask, well, how much are my taxes going to go up? 400k is the average home in um, sale price last year in Windsor County. That's the reason that we kind of went with that number. And for somebody who's not income sensitized, that's making more than that 138,000, you could expect an increase of about 100 dollars a month um, for during the early part of the, the bond repayment. So, and that's on a tax bill, you know, that's probably already at like, you know, $6,000 a year, you know, probably go up to like, um, you know, seven, somewhere like 7,000, 7,200. Okay, and in terms of, um, you know, how do, we, how do we reduce the project cost to taxpayers? In looking around the state, um, at, when we kind of came to that realization that the project was not you can't put this all in the backs of taxpayers. Part of reaching that conclusion was looking at other bond votes around the state that have failed, right? And you might, people may have heard about Stowe last week attempted to pass a $39 million bond to renovate their high school and that 
went down two to one at the polls. Same thing happened in South Burlington. They attempted um, you know, a middle school and high school project there in excess of 200 million. I think they probably uh, maybe were trying to do something a little too, um, too fancy, too opulent for their taxpayers that got voted down at the polls. Fairhaven, the school district there is a lot like ours. It was one of these Act 46 consolidated school districts with multiple towns. They were just attempting to do some renovations, something on the order of like $60 million a couple of years ago. That bond failed. Um, uh, there's another water, around Waterbury, I want to say. Um, they had a, a school bond field. Anyway, if you look at the, the projected tax impacts of those kind of failed projects, they were all coming in if they were borrowing, say, you know, on from the Vermont Bond Bank on you know 20 years, with, given their um, student populations, all around like 30% would be like the early impact to their taxpayers. One a uh, school district that has passed a bond, uh, they've done it twice, is Burlington. And Burlington has a lot more students. And as a, as a result, they've got a far lower per pupil spend. They're just more efficient in terms of how they spend education dollars. And under Vermont system, that translates to lower taxes and lower tax impacts. So all that's to say, we looked at Burlington and we, and we saw that their impact was around 16%. And we thought that was a pretty good benchmark especially considering that their school bond passed by 76% uh, voter approval, right? So we figured if that kind of tax impact um, translated to a 76% you know, voter approval, it should be good enough for, for our school district. Other ways to um, kind of bring the cost down, in addition to the Vermont Bond Bank, where a lot of kind of municipal projects get their money, we're also talking to the United States Department of Agriculture. They fund a lot of projects in Vermont with their rural innovation program. They're interested in our project. They can um, potentially give you a longer bond term, the repayment from instead of 20 years, stretch it out to say 30 or even 40 years. And also um, Winooski, it's another successful project uh, several years ago, was able to get incredibly low interest rates and some, some um some funding from the USDA. Um, so fundraising, like we said, I said earlier, five million for the uh, you know year one goal, twenty million long term. So far, we've been um, pretty successful um, with Marlena's help organizing the capital campaign. We have three point two million dollars towards that year one goal. I'm trying to raise that by December. I think it's really important by the time we roll out to taxpayers um, in the information sessions in January and February before the bond, bond vote in March, to be able to say, yeah, there's a lot of private money, right? I'm gonna show you a, um, a financial model, like Jason's indicated earlier, just how important and how powerful enrollment is. And just to kind of tease that, if you go back 20 years, our school district, the towns in our school district, because we haven't always had the present configuration, but those towns, we've lost about 225 students. Our current uh, headcount is 1,001. That's between in-district and tuition students. And when each one of those students represents essentially about $20,000, it makes everybody more expensive and tax rates go up. If you can reverse those trends, though, um, you know, in our, our thinking is um, build a new um, modern school. Um, many of the students who their families, uh, the sorts of families who kind of made decisions to go elsewhere or enroll their their um, student their uh, children elsewhere uh, will make different decisions, and we can potentially you know lean in and um, gather more students. And then that last um, piece I've already talked about that um, you know that thirty percent Vermont school construction aid program that'd be like the cavalry coming in if we get that announcement in January that they're bringing that back right on the eve of our our bond vote that would be amazing. Um, but by having a project as mature as ours is, all the work that we've been doing over the past five or six years, we we're already in detailed design. Every other bond that's gone to their voters, they weren't as far along as we are. And to have a project as far along as we are, if the state reinstitutes that funding, we'll be at the top of the list. So that's that's a good place to be. All right, uh, Marlene, are you able to call up the, the bond model here? Well, the problem is I can, but then I have to input. So I was thinking, I made you a co-host. Would you be able to screen share and pull it up? Sure. Or see what I can do. Mm -hmm. 
Let's see. Yeah. Let me get back to my Zoom here. Okay. Mm -mm. Let me know when you can see it. Yep. Is my screen sharing? Yes, it is. Okay, great. So um, Jason indicated earlier that, um, that there is a no, there's no do nothing scenario. And what you see on this um, graph are three lines. The yellow line is imaginary, which is the do nothing scenario that we can somehow not make any major investments um, in the foreseeable future in our school building. That's just not the case that we've got. The blue line represents the cost or the impact to taxpayers, the impact to the tax rate of building the new school as designed. And this graph, it's assuming a 20 year bond repayment. And you can see the year is on the bottom and the tax rate is on the left. That's the equalized tax rate across all the towns in our district. It's currently at $1.51. Um, that's how many, uh, that's the tax rate per hundred dollars of home value that um, homestead tax payers have to pay uh, in education taxes. The orange line is interesting. That represents, uh, in talking to Joe, this is only about mm, twelve million dollars of the twenty-five million that would need to be invested in the school. These are the most urgent projects. Things like the gym, um, you know, not being able to handle the snow load. People know that um, you know they've had basketball games that have been. Um, evacuated, called off in the middle of uh, snowstorms because the Raptors are making scary sounds. Like that's pretty urgent, right? That's like over a million dollars worth of, of fixes that would need to be made there just for a Band-Aid. Similar to this, the septic system, that's a $2.4 million project. Graduation night several years ago, you have, you know, um, sewage backing up in the, in the bathrooms, uh, another urgent problem. So the idea here is that these are all projects that we know we have to do. They're a matter of, of when, not if, and that that uh, when is not going to be 10 years, but we've plotted that over the 10. And this is kind of the impact of the tax rate if you have to keep making these Band-Aid repairs. And then at the end, do something more significant to maybe try to bring the building up to code, build something that's that's um, you know less extravagant. Um, than the, um, sorry, I should, much smaller than the, the, new, uh, the new building as designed. Um, but this is dead on arrival. If we tried to put this in front of the taxpayers just to kind of look at it by the numbers, we're planning on, you know, the bond repayment starting in 2027. You know, you'd be looking at a, a pretty massive tax impact, like 20, that's actually, sorry, um, I had my, in, on a 20 year repayment, you'd be looking at over 30%, right? 32%. So back to the graph, it looks even worse. Boom, right? Okay, so what can we do to bring that down? Real quick, some of the things that we talked about. Talk, you know, work with the USDA, get that bond term stretched out. Um, that takes you to what you just saw, like down to, you know, 26%, um, right, on the tax rate. And that's, you'll notice that those come down every year because the bond repayments are not even, right? They're, they go down, here's, that's on, on this line here. Um, the next thing you can do, potentially get a little bit lower interest rate, that, you know, that could help. Um, so you say 3.25, oops, not 325. <laughs> uh, so that helps a little bit, brings that graph down. See that uh, fundraising is another one. If we are able to reach our, uh, $5 million goal over the first year. Let me show you how that gets applied. And then the idea is 500,000 uh, um, after that. But those payments, then you can see those get applied to reduce the, the um, repayment in those early years. And when you do that, you get pretty close to that 16% tax cap, right? That we're going for. You're in the range. And then over time, it just keeps coming down. So you're, you're within you know, pretty close there, right? But the big thing, this is all on flat enrollment. And the last thing I'll show you is the is the big takeaway. And that is, what if you can drive enrollment? This model is capped between 800 students in district and 1,200. Right now we've got 918. Let's look at what happens if we just add 20 a year, right? Which is a, a pretty modest goal. You're talking about one or two kids per class each year, right? And that caps, like I said, at, at 1,200. You can see the graph there. 
right? That there was some fundraising that was helping drive that down a little bit. But over time, you can see that if we can replace those 200 students we've last, lost over the last 20 years, it's absolutely game changing and frees up all kinds of tax capacity. So for the people who say this is too expensive, I, I say in response, it's too expensive not to. We absolutely need to do something to um, replenish the enrollment in our district, particularly if the trends of losing about 10 kids a year continue. If we were to lose about 100, 110 more students in our district, this is what would happen to the tax rate. And this is the old, oops, excuse me, that was anticlimactic. This should be a negative 10. <laughs> um, uh, I have a way of doing that. Okay. Um, you see, there you go. So the tax rate, essentially, if you were to, you know, try to stay in the old building, you're going to hit this massive $1.92, $1 you know, if, if you try to, um, you know, fix all the things that are wrong with the old building and you wind up losing students anyway. So that's the idea. Tale of two Thanks. lines. Let's get on the blue line, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm going to go back. Are you finished, yeah, Ben? I'll go back yeah, to my give screen. Up the, okay. Give up the okay. There it is. Stop sharing. All right, just bear with me for a second. All righty, well, now we are almost done. Um, oops. Hold on. Wait. Okay, this is still a, we're, we're almost at the end, Ben, but this yeah, is a sure. new slide. Just so I think I've covered most of this. Um, you know, and, and the takeaway on this is th there isn't a do nothing scenario. Taxes are going to go up over the next, say, five years. It's really a question of what happens after that, right? You can invest in a new building that has the potential to improve programming, uh, drive enrollment, or you can, you know, kind of circle the drain with the old building. Um, the the escalation point we've made you know that would translate if we waited another three years that's another 12 million dollars that doesn't help anything um, enrollment's the single biggest factor um, doesn't take much to go a long way um, the momentum on enrollment is on our side we saw a pretty good bump to our enrollment with the the pandemic and lots of families lots of young families moving here so we've got a little bit of a window to play with and so now is really the time and then just to remember that, um, you know, every dollar raised is, um, you know, reduces the amount that has to be raised from, from taxpayers. Um, and that the, the bond, the, the, the shape of the bond is, it's, you know, almost twice as expensive in those early payments as it is at the end. So it gets more affordable over time. And yeah, that's right, this is really, you know, um, the idea of, of achieving all of the project goals that we set out to at the beginning, building that new school, high value community investment, have to do it. It's, it's well over uh, time. Um, enable students to fully access their education. You uh, know, it's a way of reducing our ongoing operating costs. This is one kind of um, factoid. Uh, when the engineers came in with the geothermal estimates, like the cost of putting them in, for a long, long time, you know, that's was a was a kind of a cost prohibitive um, alternative. But with advances in technology and efficiency, particularly compared to how much fuel oil is going up, the geothermal option is uh, projected over a, a thirty year time span to save taxpayers twenty two million dollars. That's even with the the investment cost. So it's it's from a, 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 a an operating cost standpoint, it's uh, just a completely different world. Um, facilitating greater community use and engagement with the school, uh, the theater in particular, there's a lot of potential and talk about, you know, uh, putting on programming uh, for the community there, a move towards improving safety, security, and health, ensuring the long-term sustainability of our communities, that's both in terms of enrollment and environmentally, uh, reducing 1.8 million pounds of um, carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere every year that our current facility uh, pumps out. And then celebrating Vermont values. I think sustainability is a big part of that too. Great. And uh, Marlena, do you want to bring this one home? 
Sure. Um, I've worked uh, with a couple of uh, especially principals here um, on getting the word out about our tours. I've worked with um, various administrators on our building tours, which we've had two of and we have another one um, the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. Um, those have been really, really successful. But um, it's key that um, from, you know, this isn't on this slide, but uh, that we have support from the different buildings because the communities are also different. They're pretty spread apart as well to get the word out. Um, so, you know, a flyer, I, I've made sort of like a messaging kit for, uh, we have project ambassadors as well uh, for them to get the word out. But it's really important for, you know, the posters to go up, the Alma Blasts to go out, the um, inclusion principles newsletters, um, that's all happening. And I think it's really, really um, helpful and impactful. So I, I just wanna thank you all for that. Um, you know, we're asking the community um, help us with solutions. You know, we've had all, all different ideas thrown out there. You know, um, some seem really far fetched and some are, are sort of easy. Um, so we, we very much appreciate that. Actually, the idea for this forum came from a, from an educator uh, who I know. And she said, why, you know, and I think it was a great idea. So it really no idea is too small. So uh, we appreciate it. Um, if anyone wants to volunteer, I also think that I have one or two ambassadors who are teachers, I believe, but we could use more. Um, and obviously going to the polls on town meeting day, if you live in district um, and, and voting, yes, I, I hope. Um, but um, is really important as well, so. Yeah, and just to, to send, thank you, Marlena, just to sense like a, it really feels a lot more uh, achievable, the a, a yes vote on this bond than it really ever has. Um, even seeing a, a, a community like Stowe in, last week have their bond vote kind of voted down, it was a very different sort of a thing they were trying to do up there. I saw a factoid in the paper in the uh, fallout from that that, Voter turnout is currently 18% of eligible voters at town meeting day, right? We expect to see a little bit more uh, in a presidential primary year, and we think that'll probably be helpful uh, for the for the cause. But last year when we passed that 1.65 million, I think it was only 980 some votes that were in favor of the uh, of the vote and like six or 700 some against. So like 60% in favor, it's, it's, uh, it was a nice indicator, but you know, I think it'll probably take about 1,200 votes to get this um, school bond referendum passed. You know, in favor, and when you think about you know how many people we all know and the reach that we've got, if um, people get excited about this project, I think it's a very achievable number of people to drive to the polls. Are there questions? This is always the best part of these presentations. If yeah, people, there's things you want to know. We're using hands. I'm looking, but I don't see any raised hands. See a lot of people who've kind of been around the project for a long time. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe there's, it was so thorough, there are no questions. <laughs> yeah, we're speaking to an expert audience, I think. Yeah, exactly. I'll just do one more look, but um, no, I don't, I don't see any hands raised. So it's a built-in vinyl break. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the good thing is we didn't go over, so that was good. We stayed in our lot of time. So. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks everybody. Um, if anyone does have questions, you know, feel free to reach out uh, to me. My email's on the website uh, as a school board member, uh, Marlena, Jason, uh, Sherry, Carrie, we're all pretty, uh, um, you know, pretty eyes deep in this thing at this point. So happy to um, provide any answers to any questions you can't field yourself or anything you want to know. Thank you all. Bye.